The mason bee is a solitary bee that comes out uh, various times during the summer, meaning they're every female's a queen, and they're just trying to find holes, a little tube about maybe five sixteenths of pencil width, to put 20 trips worth of pollen gathered in about a pea-sized bit of pollen, back in, lay an egg, and then go out and find mud. It's their um, mason bee. So they've put in one long tube, pollen egg mud, pollen egg mud all the way up to the tail end. She's maybe in her whole lifespan of six weeks, gonna do about maybe two tubes, maybe 15 to 20 eggs, and then she's dead. These bees are going to metamorphose through the summer and uh, spin a cocoon by August. They're a full, fully an adult bee in a cocoon that just hibernates through the winter. And then when it's about 55 degrees the next spring, the bees are coming out again. This was a male trying to come out of a cocoon and for whatever reason, he didn't make it out. These guys, this is the Californica. He's gonna fly for a couple weeks. He's gonna mate with somebody and he's a male because he's got this white nose on the front. Boom, chicka, bow, wow. Whole different type of part of the year. These are leaf cutter bees. And what we're looking at right now, these are a whole bunch of um, leaf sections that the bees last season had collected, stuffed into the back of the, these holes or the, the tubes. And uh, these bees are a little differently. They come out in the 70s and uh, 80 degree temperatures. So what makes them unique is they have to overwinter as a larva. There is 130 species of, of mason bees. So you've got various types of bees that come out at various times of the year due to their heat cues. So this is a female mason bee. She's got short little antennas and um, uh, looks kind of like a fly, but it's a little cold right now. So she's waiting for it to get just a bit warmer. Real gentle, no need to sting, just kind of sits around and um, is waiting for pollen. But that's a mason bee, a blue orchard mason bee. It's kind of late spring. She about ready to be done for the season? Yeah, she's probably got maybe two weeks left for her. I had a good thousand bees out here for um, about a good three or four weeks. And at this later part of the season, we're running out of pollen. But where there's no pollen, there's no bees. So my 800 or so bees have all just kind of wandered off throughout the neighborhood. So left here is about maybe I'll find a good 200 bees in here. We're investigating uh, a cheaper way of, of propagating mason bees. You can use uh, reeds that are kind of expensive. Back inside here are little paper tubes, a little less expensive. Here's really wide corrugation. You can see this is regular corrugation from a box, but this inside the bigger piece is an L flute. Uh, mason bees use it, kind of surprising. Uh, or not too surprising, it's a hole. It's a little abnormal shaped, but we found that mason bees use it. So as a result of this, can we then get people started with just cheap holes? The reason why I grow, I raise my mason bees in these, um, these tubes is because I actually clean the tubes in the fall. You don't have to do that. Um, a lot of people don't. The reason that I do is because it has exponentially increased uh, the amount of mason bees that I've, healthy mason bees that I've been able to raise. And like all bees, they're threatened. Um, with loss of habitat and with other, you know, pesticides, herbicides, uh, parasitic mites, and um, uh, chalk brood, which is a fungal disease, are two things that are really um, causing problems for the mason bees. And so what I what I do every fall is I actually open up these tubes and I take every single cocoon out and I sort of clean it off. And um, if it's unhealthy, then I'll subgregate it and I'll throw it away. Um, and that way I've been able to grow these incredibly healthy, healthy mason bees. And people often will try to grow mason bees in these wooden blocks that are just one solid block with holes in them. Um, but the problem with that is that you can't clean those holes, you can't clean the cocoons, you can't see if there's a problem. Uh, you can't see if parasitic wasps have invaded the cocoons and laid eggs in there. You can't see any of that. So um, eventually it becomes a really unhealthy habita uh, habitat for mason bees. So I always encourage people, use those blocks that come apart um, or use the tubes. I actually take my cocoons and then I keep them in the refrigerator over winter so that they, they have an even temperature and so that they don't uh, emerge too, uh, too early in the spring in case it gets really warm. Sometimes bees will come out early, especially mason bees. They're one of the earliest bees to emerge and then there's a cold uh, nip and there's no flowers for them to pollinate and so they die. And so um, 
I keep them in the fridge until it's I'm pretty damn sure that it's a good time to put them out. And then, <laughs> and then I put the cocoons that I that I take out. I put them in this in these boxes here. Yeah, this is my halfway house for my cocoons. And you can see the, there's a bunch of holes in there because the mason bees have emerged. And um, that's what you want to do. You want to put them in a clean place, close it up, put a hole in it. And then when the mason bees are, are ready to emerge, they'll come out of the hole and begin their life cycle. It's fun to do with kids and, it's, and it really will increase your mason bee uh, population. Some comparisons between the honeybees and the mason bees, both wonderful insects. Uh, but one's a social bee. The honeybee is uh, multiple jobs. There's centuries and pollen gatherers and nectar gatherers and the queens, etc. On the mason bee, female, male. The male's mated and gone in two weeks, and the female is, uh, is there for six weeks. Probably one of the biggest differences between the two is that how they carry pollen. The honeybee is grabbing the pollen from her. Um, she, she's very fastidious, so she's gone into the flower, she's got the pollen on her body, and she's scraping it off and licking it, and it's all on her back, portion of her legs. So it's very sticky pollen, not much falls off her body. The mason bee, just unbelievably less sophisticated, comes into a flower and just belly flops. Gets a little nectar, gets a little pollen on her body, flies off to the next flower and belly flops. Okay. She's a horrible pollen gatherer because it's fallen off her stomach everywhere. So if you're actually to go up to an orchard and, and compare what do you need to pollinate an orchard, a full hive, uh, 150,000 honeybees in comparison to about maybe 700 females. So it's almost a hundred to one ratio. And I'm not saying anyone's better. The honeybee has honey. It's just the mason bee, the blue orchard bee, is a uh, significantly different pollinator. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permian.com where we talk about mason bees, homesteading, and permaculture all the time. Boom chicka bow wow!